Hey, good. Well, it could be good morning, could be good afternoon, it could be good evening. I'm not sure when you're watching this, but uh, uh, I'd like to go over the chapter nine notes. And again, you can use this video to uh, uh, kind of as a safety net. Um, I'll be doing this in class when we frere, and I'll be doing this in class a few different times when we're reviewing uh, in our FREV and getting ready for the chapter nine test. But basically, this is the chapter nine uh, lecture via Zoom recording. So here we go. Let me share my screen real quick. And uh, all right, so chapter nine is basically about two presidencies. Our first two, our first president, you probably already know, Mr. George Washington. He was a general. He was a leader of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, just pretty popular guy, very well respected, right? Uh, so he becomes our very first president. And it, he, he was unopposed. First time that ever happened and, and the last time that'll ever happen. That'll vote, that will, uh, he, he basically got all of the electoral college votes um, and becomes our first uh, president. And as our first president, his vice president was Mr. John Adams, who's going to be our second president. Now, here's a pretty funky thing about uh, George Washington. His presidency was precedent setting. You know what that means? It kind of sounds like the world, word president, but it's not. It's precedent, not president. And precedent setting basically means traditions that are going to be followed. And G. Dub knew he's like, man, I'm in a, I'm in a really special situation here, a very special place. I've been chosen to be the very first president of this young nation. What I do, people are going to follow. People are going to follow. That's called precedent setting. It's almost like this. If I allow one kid to chew gum in class, well, I just set a precedent for any kid to be able to chew gum in class. Other people will follow the precedent that I set. Does that make sense? Isn't that funky? We, we let you chew gum nowadays. Um, but I remember the vast majority of my career, we didn't allow students to chew gum. It was, uh, I'm so glad you can chew gum. Anyways, not even that important, but hopefully you get the uh, analogy there. Um, so under Washington, a cabinet was created. These are advisors for the president. These are people that are experts in fields uh, uh, of all kinds of different fields of knowledge to help a president with his or her decision making, right? That's why when you become president of the United States, I hope you consider me to be the secretary of education so I can help you um, make some decisions to improve education in our nation. So if you become president, you're not going to be alone. You get to surround yourself with lots of smart women and men to be able to help make decisions. And our first cabinet was only four. Now I think there's like uh, 16, something like that. Um, but anyways, but the first four, Secretary of State was Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of War, they don't have a Secretary of War anymore. I think, I mean, I think that's more like Secretary of Defense, Homeland Security, kind of all merged into one. Um, and the Attorney General, uh, General was Edmund Randolph. Now, Attorney General is basically a fancy word for head lawyer person. So the Attorney General for, for uh, the state of Michigan is head lawyer for the state of Michigan. Attorney General for the United States, kind of the head lawyer, advisor um, on legal matters. And so you can see that Washington is taking a brand new step for a brand new country. Let's let's create a cabinet for of advisors. We're not done because I want you to look at it this way. It's almost like Washington, when he comes into office, the house is built. The stairs are there. The plumbing is there. The electricity is there. The walls are painted, but the house is empty. The house needs to get filled. We need to put some furniture in there. We need to put some paintings up. We need to put uh, the, the holders for the toothbrush in the bathroom. We need to put toilet paper on the toilet paper rolls. We need to put food in the uh, fridge and in the, in, in, the, in the pantry. And the house isn't done yet. Under George Washington, the house will start to get finished. We'll start to move the furniture in. We'll start to put the nice bed sheets on the bed. We'll start to determine where that nice rocking chair goes. Think of it that way. There's a lot to be done. You just don't move into a house and it's just empty. You fill it up. Time to fill it up as far as the U.S. government. So part of that was the cabinet. <laughs> no pun intended, you know, cabinet like dresser. All right, anyway, so... Um, what else is going to be created? Well, let's take a look here. The court system is going to be created by Congress, 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 Congress. 
come back to that. Um, so wait, wait, Congress set up the courts? Yeah, they were the ones responsible for setting up the court system. And this law here, the Judiciary Act of 1789, Congress basically said, well, we're gonna have two types of courts, federal and state courts. Federal courts, DC, state courts and all the other individual states, all right? Um, and they also chose a Supreme Court Chief Justice by the name of John Jay. That's a fancy phrase for basically head judge person for the United States Supreme Court, all right? And look at this, a little bit of review from the last couple chapters. The Bill of Rights became the Constitution, remember? Pretty important promise that was made good um, by Congress. So when you think about things like the court system and things like the Bill of Rights, uh, Congress was pretty important, right? Wait, you mean, Mr. Panetta, that Congress was responsible for starting to really make this house a home? Absolutely, absolutely. It wasn't the president by themselves. Remember, we're a federalism system. There's a lot of sharing in the responsibility of creating a government and our laws and all that stuff, right? Now, our economy, we're kind of hurting. And so George Washington asked his good friend, Alexander Hamilton, and Washington chose Hamilton over guess who? Jefferson. And guess what? This starts to begin some bad blood. Oh man, you chose him and not me. And then Hamilton's like, yeah, I got chosen over you. And you know what? We already started to see this earlier with the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, but are you starting to see two different sides? Political parties are starting to develop, all right? So Hamilton had this three-prong plan, like, you know, there's three prongs and a fork, you know, three-prong, three. Get used to that. I'm going to use this three-prong a lot this year. Um, number one, let's pay back debts. Number two, uh, let's, because um, uh, we, we had war debts, and uh, the South didn't like this. They're like, why should we pay back debts? And so they made a compromise. There it is. It, <laughs> the compromise is not just for the Constitutional Convention. We still have compromises today. And they basically said, I'll tell you what, we pay back wartime debts, let's move the capital, which were in places like New York City, farther north, farther south, maybe more in the middle, in a place called Washington, DC, between the states of Maryland and Virginia. Did you know DC is not in any state? It's its own chunk of land, right? So DC does not belong to Maryland, DC does not belong to Virginia. But the South got the capital farther south, and they liked that. The second thing Hamilton thought was like, let's create a national bank because, you know, we're going to hopefully get rich as a nation. We need one thing to be able to organize all this, all right? And he also said, let's raise higher tariffs. Now, a tariff is a tax on imported goods. So if I've got two rocking chairs to buy, one is made in New England here, maybe in a place like New York or Massachusetts, and another one is made in London, England. Um, let's say they're both 25 bucks a piece, but because we place tariffs on imported goods, stuff coming into the country, that rocking chair from London is gonna be more expensive. So guess which one we're gonna buy? We're gonna buy the one from New York, the one from Massachusetts, because it's cheaper, because it doesn't have that tariff, which is a tax on imported goods. Tariffs help to protect businesses, which the northeastern part is huge, hugely involved with, all right? There's going to be a lot more on that as we move through this uh, year together. Uh, so there's Hamilton's three-pronged plan, all right? So lesson one is all about G-Dub, you know, being elected and, and getting started, setting some important precedents um, that people are going to follow. And the house is starting to turn into a home. Now, lesson two, Life ain't all smooth all the time. There are bumps in the road and Washington's administration was no different. There was a lot of trouble in the new nation. Okay, and it comes in a lot of different directions. The first one was the Whiskey Rebellion. Pennsylvania farmers getting mad about a tax on whiskey. And remember the Shays Rebellion? It scared the living daylights out of us because we had such a weak government. We weren't sure if we could handle a crisis like this. Well, guess what? Whiskey Rebellion, Washington puts that fire out immediately and with some conviction. In other words, he got the job done like right now. And Washington takes this opportunity to say this. I mean, think about the brilliance of his leadership. 
be cool or else. Look, you guys are upset. So what? It's okay to be upset, but do your protest properly. Voice your opinion peacefully. Because if you don't, you might be getting a taste of the military on you. And so it was just an important reminder. We've got things in place for we the people. For we the people. So be cool or else. What are some other problems? So Washington's first test passes with flying colors. Hooray! Uh, another test, Western land. There was tension with basically three uh, nations, actually several nations, because Native American nations make up dozens of nations. Um, but Spain, Britain, and Native Americans, and a lot of it was just land. Some of it was trade dealings. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, you know, we were having some tensions with our European uh uh, countries of Spain and Britain. But as far as the Native American nations, we took care of that business and it basically led to some fighting and it caused Native Americans to lose their land in a treaty called Greenville. Get used to this. This is one of the saddest parts of the Native American chapter. Continuous treaties that rob Native Americans of land that they rightfully owned and were promised by our government taken away. Wait, the promise was broken by our government? Uh, yeah, get used to this. It's gonna happen the rest of the way, every single time, every single promise broken, okay? So get used to that. So the big losers in this conflict for Western land, big time Native Americans. Now, we remember we talked about uh, Spain and Britain. Well, we're not only having trouble with Spain and Britain, but France gets in the mix too. And a lot of it, is because of uh, trade. Trade is a big thing here. And there were a lot of people that were saying, man, we wanna, we wanna go to war with, with France. No, we wanna go to war with Britain. And, and Washington said, hey, time out everybody. We're not going to war with anybody. And he said, he issued this thing called the proclamation of neutrality. We're gonna stay out of people's business. We get into people's business, that's what causes trouble. So we're not going to mess with people. We're just going to stay neutral. We're going to be cool to France. We're going to be cool to Britain. Now, the one thing they weren't cool about, Washington and the government was not cool about, Native Americans. We went after Native Americans. And that's why a lot of their land got taken initially. Wait, so Washington wanting to stay out of people's business applied to all nations except for Native American nations? That's correct. So isn't that a dark precedent to set? to go after Native Americans, because guess what? All the other presidents are gonna follow that precedent. And you know what the ending of that dark and awful chapter is for Native Americans in this country. Um, as far as our problems with Great Britain, we, they, you know, they were impressing our sailors, they weren't leaving our land. Impressing doesn't mean like, hey, look at me, don't I look good? No, not that, not that kind of impress. Impressing the sailors basically means, uh, yeah, I'm a, British uh, sailor, uh, get on my boat. You are now an English uh, sailor. Uh, I don't want to be an English sailor. I'm an American sailor. You want to get shot? All right, get on my boat. You're an English sailor now. So impressing sailors was kind of like kidnapping and forcing them to join the side of the British. Not very cool. France is going to do that later too. So stay tuned to that. Um, but what was that Washington able to do with all this trouble with Great Britain? They were able to fix it with something called Jay's Treaty. So wait, 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 wait. Washington has another problem with Britain and he's able to, to fix it, pass with flying colors. That's right, that's right. And as far as our trouble with Spain, Spain once again trade. Now, Mr. Panetta keeps using the word trade. Yeah, trade is a huge deal because it's a moneymaker. And when you have conflicts with other country, trade oftentimes can suffer the most. Spain was limiting our trade on the Mississippi River, but guess what Washington did? He and his government, they were able to resolve it with Pinckney's Treaty. Whoa, 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 whoa. Washington has three tough tests to start off with, and he's able to deal with all three right off the bat. That's right. That's right. He is doing really well out of the gates. All right. Now, Washington decided after two terms, four plus four, each term is four years. After two terms, he was gonna step down. So two terms equals four plus four equals eight. And when Washington set that precedent to step down, 
it's an important precedent that will be followed by other presidents. In other words, Washington basically thought, you know what, I'm doing fine, but the nation needs this new new ideas and new flavors to come in at least every eight years. So I'm stepping down. So he set this precedent, which presidents are going to follow all the way up to FDR, who will go more than two terms, only president. And we end up passing an amendment to make sure that our presidents are only two terms. But isn't that cool that Washington's decision just for two terms was so respected and everybody thought that followed him thought that was the way to go. What an important precedent that Washington set by stepping down after two terms. But before he stepped down, this is a very famous farewell address. I think it was in a bar in New York City, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, he basically said, hey, I got two pieces of advice for y'all. Number one, stay neutral, stay out of people's business. Don't, don't be, you know, just keep to ourselves. You know, you're best friends with somebody, guess what? That best friend's enemies are now your enemies. We don't want any of that. We don't want to cause problem. We're a young nation. Stay neutral. And the second piece of advice, I see what's happening here. Alexander Hamilton, Jefferson, you guys don't like each other. I see what's going on here. They're starting to form these political parties, differing beliefs that are combating each other. Hey, avoid political parties. It'll ruin our nation. Did we listen? to either of these two pieces of advice? On the count of three, what's the answer? One, two, three, no. Not even close, not even close. Uh, some textbooks will say that our a policy neutrality was followed. Tell that to a Native American. Tell that to a Native American, okay? Um, and as far as political parties, heck no, you see where we are today. I mean, right now, Washington is up in, in, in heaven or wherever saying, man, I told you, I told you, political parties will ruin this nation. You are so divided. You can't stand each other. I told you this was going to be a mess. So his two pieces of advice, we did not follow. All right. Speaking of which, so Washington passes all of these challenges with flying colors, sets some important precedents. But guess what? The political parties have already formed. Even the great George Washington is not powerful enough and his superpowers cannot keep this stuff from happening. And basically there were two political parties that formed. The Federalists, ooh, isn't that a, a familiar name? Federalists? And the Republicans, actually their real name was the Democratic Republicans, nickname, AKA the Republicans. It's almost like my full name is Benedict Luce Panetta, but my friends call me Ben. They are the Democratic Republicans, AKA the Republicans. And look at this, y'all, look at the way I set this up. I made it nice and easy. So there, it's almost like a T-chart where things are compared across uh, across the page from each other. So let's take a look. The, the leader for the Federalists, Hamilton, for Republicans, Jefferson. Federalists, they like strong government. Republicans, they like strong, Federalists like strong federal government, national government, Nas national and federal mean the same thing. The Republicans, they like a strong state government. They're kind of freaked out by that thing. Remember? Wait, so the anti-federalist flavor is kind of morphed into a new name called the Republicans? Very good. Good job. Um, the, Repu or the Federalists were what called loose constructionists, and the Republicans were called strict constructionists. What does that mean, Mr. Panetta? If you don't like the word constructionist, think of it in terms of interpretation. So the Federalists, they interpreted the Constitution very loosely, where the Republicans were very strict about it. And I'm gonna give you a very good example, a very good analogy here, okay? Now, I don't, I don't mean to be disrespectful to any, uh, any type of belief, but this is just a, a, a good analogy for interpreting something very strictly uh, versus something very loosely, okay? And I remember the loose was the, uh, Federalists, the strict, were the Republicans. The Bible, the most popular book on planet Earth. You have some Christians that interpret the Bible very loosely. Oh, you know, seven days that the Lord created the, the world and the universe, that's really, that's just a loose interpretation of, you know, billions and billions of years where there are some Christians that are very strict constructionists, very strict interpreters of the Bible. No, 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 seven days means seven times 24 hours. That is the greatness of God. 
So you're going to have, you know, some Christians that are very loose on the Bible, some that are very strict. Same thing in government. Some people interpret the Constitution loosely, some very strictly. All right. Moving on. The Federalists, they love the idea of, Na of Hamilton's National Bank. Uh, the Republicans, they were against the National Bank. The Federalists, they love Britain. The Republicans, they love France. So if you love Britain, you hate France. If you love France, you hate Britain. You start to see this. Um, the Federalists were generally supported by the Northern rich. And the, and the Republicans, their biggest uh, followers were the Southern farmers, ordinary citizens. Okay, uh, not as rich, more or less, you know. Um, so mostly uh, Northern for the Federalists and mostly Southern for the Anti-Federalists. Oh, sorry, geez, oh, Pete, there I go again. Mostly Southern for the Republicans, but you can see why I made that mistake. Ideals of the Anti-Federalists are very similar to the ideals of the, of the Republicans, maybe just a different name, right? All right, so. You got our political parties, our very first real election where two people are against each other. Uh, the Federalist candidates, John Adams for president, Charles Pinckney for vice president. Uh, they're gonna end up defeating the presidential candidate for the Republicans, Thomas Jefferson, and his running mate, Aaron Burr. But check it out. There's a mess up in the ground rules. You ever play a game or make up a game and you change the rules to make the game better as it goes on? Well, guess what? There was a rule that didn't work very well. Uh, but because of the old rules in the Constitution, Thomas Jefferson became the vice president. It's what, I'm, it's what I call our first, oops, oh, oh, this is bad. We shouldn't have it like this election, all right? If we still did it this way, first place, Donald Trump would be president. Second place, Hillary Clinton would be vice president. You see why we say this is an oops election? Because you imagine the White House uh, in Washington, D.C., where Trump is president and Clinton is vice president, mm, you know, oil and water, stuff like that, right? <laughs> so you can see why we're going to change this later as we move along, okay? Now, John Adams as president. We've been talking almost this whole time about George Washington, right? And John Adams, I'm going to be honest with you, doesn't get his fair share of... I think focus. I would say most hysteria, I think a lot of historians really are not crazy about John Adams. I kind of like the guy. And I think you'll see that there's a bitter sweetness here of John Adams. So first of all, he became our first president, um, but his one of his first challenges was something called the XYZ affair. Remember France? I told you they were dissing us like Britain was, <clears throat> impressing our sailors knocking out some of our trade routes. And so we tried to go over there to negotiate with France. And instead of France being nice about it and trying to you know, figure this out, they said, yeah, we could all do this if you give us some of this. So they were trying to bribe. They were trying, these, these agents were trying to bribe our Americans. And these agents were known as X, Y, and Z, and that's why it's called the X, Y, Z affair. This caused a lot of tension in the United States. A lot of people were saying, we got to go to war with France. They can't do that to us. Try to bribe us. That ain't right. That ain't right. And so Jefferson's got his first fire he's trying to put out. People getting ticked off and wanting to go to war with France. And if you remember the T-chart, who likes France? The Republicans. So the ones that really want to go against France are basically Thomas Jefferson or John Adams' own party, the Federalists. All right. Important to know, John Adams, a Federalist, and his political party, the Federalists, his political party really wants to go to war with France. Okay. John Adams, let's wait and see. His second real challenge was something called the Alien and Sedition Acts. This is, I don't want you to get too confused. Basically, it's this. A, uh, this kept aliens from working against the Federalists. This was a national security decision that was seen by some as a threat to basic rights. In other words, ready? People were speaking out against John Adams and the Federalist government. And John Adams thought, this ain't right. We're a young nation. We're very fragile. If we have people dissing us, that's just really, that's going to ruin us as a nation. That, that is threatening our national security. And so guess what? The Alien and Sedition Acts basically said that we can, we can shut you up if you're speaking out against the country, 
And as far as you immigrants coming in, we can make it a lot harder for you to get into our country and a lot easier for us to kick you out. So don't talk smack against the American government. Mr. Panetta, that's not fair. That's violating some basic rights like the Fourth Amendment. Or no, no. Like, like the First Amendment, sorry. Freedom of speech, right? But when national security is involved, you can kiss your Bill of Rights goodbye. And that's, there have been presidents, lots of presidents that have done that, that have compromised our basic rights in the name of national security, okay? So John Adams is going to try to protect our nation by keeping people from being so vocal against our government. And I tell you what, the Republicans are outraged, right? And the Republicans reacted with their own backfire uh, or their own Th their own counterattack, and they called it the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. And it basically said, hey, look, if there's a federal law that disses us states and compromises states' rights, which is one of the most important vocabulary words, states' rights means you can't ignore the states and the rights that states have. If your federal law, the Alien Sedition Acts, disses us, we can ignore it. And that's what was called the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. Nullify is a fancy word for ignore, get rid of. So Thomas Jefferson and his crew basically fired back with like, hey, you're gonna do that to us. You're gonna do that to us. Here you go. Here's what we're gonna do to you. Virginia, Kentucky resolutions. So you can kind of see that, man, there's a lot of this going on, right? A lot of this is going on. Now, here's the final piece of the puzzle. There's a ton of people wanting to go to war with France. Jeff or uh, John Adams, his own party, the Federalists, really want to go after France because of all the bad stuff France is doing to us on the high seas. But look at this. Instead of war, Adams maintained peace with France. He continued George Washington's policy of neutrality. We don't need a war right now. We're a very young, fragile nation. All right. And when, wait, you mean John Adams goes against his party's wishes? That's correct, right? If John Adams would have gone to war with France, it would have strengthened his party. It would have almost ensured his second reelection term. But because he decided to go and make peace with France, it caused him, uh, caused Adams's political career to be ruined. And it's gonna literally split the Federalist Party, all right? So John Adams decides, I'm gonna stay peaceful with France. His party gets upset with him. The party splits. And when a party splits, they're not whole, they're split. The other party's gonna benefit. And this will help the Republicans and Thomas Jefferson, all right? So guess who's gonna be our third president? Thomas Jefferson. So do you understand this? Adams has a decision, stay peaceful with France or make war like my party wants. If I make war, my party gets stronger. If I make war with France, I'll get reelected. But you know what? It ain't about me. I gotta protect our nation. That's the job of the president. So even though my party wants to go to war with France, it's best that we stay neutral and peaceful with France. It will kill his political career Spoiler alert, he doesn't get reelected because his party will split, opens the door for Thomas Jefferson to become our third president. John Adams did what was good for the country and it ruined his career. And he knew it was gonna, but he knew what was the right thing to do. His decision to go peacefully with France will shoot his political career in the foot. And I have a story for you on that later. It's one of my favorite stories to tell. So, hey, ladies and gentlemen and everybody, that is chapter nine. Use these, use this video any way you'd like to. It's just kind of a safety net. Hey, remember, because loves you, no doubt, because signing out.